Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is part two of our interview with Paul Rosenberg about his novel, A Lodging of Wayfaring Men. Uh, You can hear part one of the interview on the previous episode if you haven't heard that yet. So thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoy the interview. I wanted to just ask you um, another topic that um, that you brought into the book is about uh, relationships and sex and sort of different mm-hmm. sort of different well expectations about sexuality and so forth. And you have one of the characters learns a whole lot about her own parents' approach to sexuality and and her views right. and so forth. And um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you what were your thoughts about what you you felt needed to be sort of tackled in this book about that. What was it that you were really um, trying to get through on on that topic? Well, the important thing to me, uh, especially on that subject, is that people always jump from one extreme to another. Uh, either in either sex is bad and nasty and and you know it's a vile thing that we need to restrain either that or it's cheap and meaningless and neither of those are true um you know and it's a problem that people have gone goofy on throughout all history uh and it's very instinctive and it's very difficult to get past and to look at it rationally uh, and it's a very difficult subject. You know, humans are are not absolutely unified beings. You know, we have reason, we have various instincts, and they don't always play nice with each other. Um, so, uh, you know, people need to accept that difficulty as a fact and then begin to try to make sense of it for themselves and live in a way that is useful for all involved and healthy for all involved. And I kind of wanted to make that point um, with a few different characters and from different angles and to try to address those subjects without getting dogmatic in any direction. Uh, But, you know, really the characters in the book live very traditional lives. Even the people that are asking these questions ended up living generally traditional lives, which is interesting because when you look at it, that's really overall in the long run, probably the most effective way for human beings to live. Um, The problem, the problem with, sorry, by traditional, mm -hmm. what you mean is that, they um, they pair up and get married and live together as a, a in a monogamous relationship and 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 so that's what you mean by traditional presumably yeah yes yeah. that that's it that's exactly right and the problem with it is when people are forced to do it and if you don't do this you're weird or there's something wrong with you or there's some problem that's wrong uh, once you get past it though most pe- most of us really live and produce better in a situation kind of like that. It should not be made in any way mandatory upon people, which is is a real problem. But on the other hand, it probably is best for most of us at most of the time. Right, yeah. And do you think that um, the sort of, you know, um, hang-ups or repression about sexuality and the the kind of veering from one extreme to another – that, you know, as you say, that it's either it's um, it's cheap and meaningless, or it's um, bad and sinful, or whatever. Do you, do you think that that mm-hmm. uh, that has any relationship to uh, the state and and being like? what well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, do you think those kind of hang-ups that people have are, are at all related to living in a society that's run, you know, in in a in a violent way with a sort of with a state in control and so forth, or do you think that that comes from the family or other areas or where, where do you think that that comes from um it's all mixed together but it definitely has relationships uh with coercive rulership um it's there's a, a writer uh who's very interesting very wrong about certain things but a fascinating guy named wilhelm reich um uh, wrote in the 20s and 30s and 40s um, and he called it a mandatory. How did he? How did he describe it? It was uh, essentially an enforced, enforced set of sexual role standards, 
And he says, and more or less establishes it pretty well, that just about every culture you can find has an enforceable and enforced norm. And this is the way you must, you must handle uh, relationships and sex, either that or you're a bad person. And it was enforced upon everybody. Right. Uh, and, and that has existed, gosh, and, and almost always everywhere. And, and it's very, very unhealthy. Not everybody is exactly the same as everybody else. Uh, and you can't enforce such things on people without making them slaves which goes right back into the rulership and coercive rule mentality. Right, right. Fascinating. Uh, thank you for, for sharing that. It was really interesting. Sure. Uh, I, wanted to ask, Good. Um, I wanted to ask another um, theme um, that comes up um, in the book is the theme of, I guess, the unconscious mind and emotions mm -hmm. and the, the, um, the sort of well, uh, defenses that build up over time uh, from fight or flight experiences in the past. And you have a whole, you know, in a sense, almost like a whole other part of this book is about some of the um, the, the ideas running through that, that uh, George is, is developing with his, um, you know, with his, his new sort of drug, which allows you to mm -hmm. effectively kind of reboot your unconscious it seems that was sort of sort of the i'm not sure if that's a very good description of it but i can see that there's mm -hmm. a, a whole question about the relationship between the conscious rational mind and the unconscious mind and emotions and their long-term effects and and i was very interested to to ask you you know what where did these thoughts of yours come from you, obviously you put a lot of thought into that what was what was the backstory to to that aspect of this novel Oh boy, isn't that a great question? <laughs> um, actually, it's a bunch of things. I'll tell you a couple of random facts that that I that that were part of it. Um, gosh, back at the turn of the last century, over a hundred year or a hundred years ago, more or less, there was a, a really exceptional uh, minister, a really special guy named John Lake, and Lake. Um, was not, you know, just a traditional minister, uh, but he was a very interesting and interested guy. He, he studied all sorts of things. He was into science. He would show up. You know, this was back in the old days when, you know, uh, not everything was restricted at all moments of life. And he would just show up where people were doing interesting experiments and ask to politely if he could sit in and watch. And he would, and he would be involved in the experiments, and he would sit and discuss with the scientists the theological aspects of what they were doing, and all sorts of things. Uh, hell of a guy. Um, but he, he was very certain that strong emotions are, are uh, passed uh, from, in, in probably from his words, the spirit to the rest of your body, and they affect your body. And he was concerned particularly with health and healing and things like this. But that always stuck with me. And I thought, how interesting. Emotions pass through your body. Um, well, you know, maybe Lake's right, maybe he wasn't, but it's a very interesting concept. And then some, some years later, I, you know, uh, found out that there were people doing serious experiments with neuropeptides, which are um, essentially protein strings that the body puts out. And it turns out that they put them out, that the body puts them out when you're very scared or when you're having some other sort of emotion. And these neuropeptides essentially transfer information through the body to places where nerves won't go. And um, these neuropeptides, and there's all sorts of different ones for different uh, emotions and for different uh, uh, communications in the body, and they stick in cellular receptors. And it seems, it turns out that most of the cells in our body have thousands upon thousands of cellular receptors in their, uh, in their walls. And uh, at this point, I was reading about this and beginning to think quite a bit about it. And I found the work of a lady named Candace Pert, P-E-R-T. And she was doing some, some work along these lines. She was one of the, she was on the team of people that discovered the opiate receptor, which was a big deal when it happened. 
Um, and then she subsequently got to work on a bunch of other things. But she did a bunch of work in this area. And I just put her work and, and uh, a lot of the papers that I could find on neuropeptides and came up with this idea of breakers, which I am quite certain could be done and should be done, uh, although I'm not aware of anybody having done it yet. Right. Wow, fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of followed that out um, and said, you know, what should this become and how would this develop? And then, as you know, throughout the book, uh, it begins as one thing and then gets into some other areas that I, I found were really interesting. And uh, I'm, you know, as certain as I can be without doing the actual experiments that it's fairly close to the way it would go in real life. But, you know, you never quite find out exactly until you do the real experiments. I guess this is the, one of those things where you can, you know, have a, have a look back in 15 years and see what <laughs> see what's happened. <laughs> see whether I going. hope so. Yes. <laughs> when you were researching this stuff, did you uh, also find that there was this sort of pushback against this type of research, um, as there was sort of in the in the novel? You know, to a limited degree, yes. It wasn't the same as as the novel. Um, Actually, uh, I'll tell you this, where I got some of the pushback stuff from, from the novel uh, was from a, a friend of mine, who, uh, an older gentleman who's unfortunately passed away now, named Thomas Dorman. Uh, he was a doctor out of uh, Seattle and a, just a wonderful, rare human being. Uh, I, I was really deeply saddened when he passed a few years ago. Uh, but Tom and I discussed some of this stuff. And he explained how the medical associations who, with whom he had sorts, all sorts of problems, uh, how they operated and how they did things like that. And I probably got more of it from him, although Candace Pert has had a lot of problems in her career. At one point, she put out, gosh, I think it was a tape, uh, where uh, the title of it was, uh, Your Body is Your Subconscious Mind. Um, and she uh, did a lot of work on that. She ended up getting into kind of new agey sort of, sort of stuff. And she was uh, minimized and ignored and looked down upon for those reasons, uh, which I thought was, you know, really unfair. I mean, I'm not particularly new agey, but, you know, what the hell? That's not a reason to, to just toss somebody off because you disagree on one religious aspect. The, the lady had done some wonderful work and was, I'm sure is still capable of doing great work, but most people are ignoring her. But I kind of had a question, a big general question, but also I just wanted to sort of, um, you know, thank you for writing the book, really, and, and it's just a fascinating story, and the characters are so rich and so much depth to it. I just, it's fantastic. So I just wanted to, you know, thank you for writing such a, a great uh, piece of work. You're very well. Freedom and, and philosophy and liberty and so on. Here, here. Great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so my well, thanks, guys. Off the back of that, oh, your mother mocking, um, was, you know, do you have any imminent or, or future plans to um, write more fiction or, um, you know, is it top secret or what? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not top secret. Actually, I am planning on writing more fiction. Uh, over the last several years, I've done a lot of writing of nonfiction um, because I, you know, I kind of had to get to the to the bottom of my particular rabbit hole and to figure out a bunch of things. Um, one of those nonfiction books that I guess I finished three years ago or so uh, is called Production versus Plunder, and it's a history book. And it's essentially the history of the Western world from uh, the end of the Ice Age till now. Uh, and um, it was really an important book for me uh, because after decades, really, of reading history books and, and old texts and going to museums and, you know, reading everybody from the respected guys to the crazy guys on the fringe, I finally got an understanding of ancient history. Uh, before then, you know, you can read the books and, and they have names and dates and pictures, but it just doesn't make sense. I, didn't, I couldn't understand who these people were, how they thought, why they lived the way they did. It just didn't make any sense. And finally, as I was writing this book, it made sense. 
So my next novels are going to be uh, a set of novels. I'm not quite sure how many, uh, but they are going to be... Um, how shall I, it's going to have two different uh, themes. One is going to be modern day, um, not like wayfaring men, but you know those that sort of um, group of people. Probably not quite as techy, um, but that sort, of, those sorts of people. Um, and the other one, the other thread, major thread. Uh, there'll be lots of sub threads. Uh, are people in ancient times and I want to be able to describe how they live why they did what they did what their world was like how it seemed to them um, how our world that we take for granted took shape what how did it really begin how did it turn into what it is how did the first you know how did the first states form how did the first rulers take over how did they um, you know, become king. How did all this happen? And I'm going to go through the first book will be uh, the original, the original good guys in world history who are an as yet unnamed group of farmers who come down out of what is now Armenia uh, after the Ice Age. Um, fascinating and group of people that are known a little bit, but just Nobody pays attention to them. They're, they're the ones who started everything. Uh, and I'm going to begin with them. Uh, the second book will probably take place sometime before Greece. And probably the third book will be one that's going to be a hell of an interesting one to write, which will be set probably in Judea in the first century, and maybe in Rome as well. So this is a very interesting set of books, and I'm not sure how far it will go, but it's going to be really, really cool. Well, that actually sounds fascinating. I'm, I love ancient history and uh, anthropology and things like that. And um, that sounds like a huge scope and scale and lots of things to work with as well. So I'm, that sounds very exciting. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be, you know, I mean, writing a novel is a very... Is a very um, it's a difficult thing to do, although like any writing, you know, after you do it once, the second time is a little easier and the third time is still easier than that. So I, I'm hoping it gets easier faster. I think Christoph was going to ask something, but before he does, I just want to quickly um, ask you, Paul, about the, um, the theme of uh, religion in the book. Because it's really mm -hmm. interesting to me. I'm, I'm not religious myself, um, and I know that, you know, you've obviously read – Iron Rand, and you, you know you're 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 not a. I, I don't. I can't imagine you as being a um, sort of an obviously traditional religious person um, from the way that you write about um, religion. Like you've obviously got a very um, a very rounded view of the different ways in ri in which um, religion has been uh, abused um, or abusive in in the past. You actually write about that in in, in parts of the book. But I do see that mm -hmm. you that you are also, um, you know, uh, uh, as well as writing about how religion has sort of had a negative effect in some ways. I can also see that you that you are writing about um, religion as somebody who who perhaps is religious. So I'm curious, sort of, what your, you know, what your unique take on on all of that is. Oh boy! Wow, is that a great question? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I've been uh, through both sides uh, of the coin and have had a lot of friends uh, on on either side uh, of the issue. Um, religion is certainly part of the human experience, but that doesn't mean it's either right or wrong. Uh, the rightness or wrongness of it really, at least in the Judeo-Christian tradition, cannot be proved because the the God of the Judeo Christian God is outside of the known universe. Uh, so you, you, there's really no way to, to really prove it. Uh, on the other hand, um, there have been a lot of people that have a, had a lot of experiences that were very meaningful for them. And that's not nothing. That's not something that I'm willing to ignore or to say, no, 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 they're just crazy people, or it doesn't matter. It does matter. It matters deeply to them, and it matters deeply to everybody else who they live with. Uh, 
and of course, there have been a lot of legitimate cases of people who've had you know, known things that they shouldn't know or been healed of something that shouldn't have gone away by itself or so on and so forth. And honestly, I, I think those things really need to be dealt with um, separated from expectations in religion. I think there is definitely something there, whatever it may be, who knows? I can't say it's a particular God or a particular religion. Um, but there's a lot of things that go on uh, that it, they don't quite fit in anybody's mold, but that doesn't mean they're not beneficial and we shouldn't pay attention to them. I, am I answering your question fairly well? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think, you know, as... As somebody who who I'm I am an uh, a, I guess you would call a strong atheist, but I I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't find your book to be um, you know I didn't find myself thinking like oh I can't be bothered with this or whatever in terms of the religious stuff that's in there because I I can see that mm -hmm. you, that you have uh, quite a, a nuanced view about the difference between I suppose what you might call personal faith and uh, organized religions and mm -hmm. also. Um, you know the difference between, I guess, um, evidence of of, uh, of acts and and the importance of of religion in people's lives and stuff. So yeah, I appreciate you you explaining that. It's interesting to to hear your take on it. Oh, good, my pleasure. <laughs> did anybody um, did anybody have uh, any other thoughts that they or, or uh, questions that they would like to ask Paul? Just briefly, I wanted to ask. Um... Uh, what was his uh, motivation or thinking behind re releasing the book um, under the Creative Commons license? Um, it, just sort of looking around online, it looks like you can you can sort of buy the book on Amazon uh, through one particular publisher, and then um, let's see that it's available as a free ebook in a bunch of places under the Creative Commons license. And there's sort of a donate if you want to kind of approach to it. So I just wanted to to uh, hear about why he decided to do that and what, what it might reflect about his uh, thoughts on intellectual property and that kind of thing. Okay. So we're talking about the copyright and creative commons and so on. Um, really didn't know what I wanted to do uh, on that at the beginning. Uh, creative commons seemed like a fair enough way to do it. I'm, I'm no fan of copyright. Um, it's really kind of an unnatural sort of thing for, for the Internet. Uh, it was never all that great for paper books, but whatever. Um, so I really didn't know what I, I wanted to do on that. Um, uh, I've actually gone through a couple different changes. I don't even remember what the first one was. It might have been Creative Commons. Uh, but essentially, I, I really don't care much about copyright. Uh, there may be a copyright notice in 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 most of the books but it's just it's just their kind of pro forma i don't even i don't really care actually the first electronic edition was put out by a friend of mine who didn't know i was the author at the time and uh, uh the first version was was anonymous uh and uh, so he actually scanned the whole you know 450 whatever pages and put it up on the internet and said i don't care it's the right thing to do <laughs> and he didn't know it was you. No, he didn't know it was me at first. <laughs> I, I remember seeing a book review, uh, I guess from a few years ago, that was like, you know, we're, I don't even know how I got this book. It's by this anonymous person. It's about all this crazy stuff. And and like he it, uh, he had been, you know, already interested in I don't know libertarianism or whatever. And he's like, I don't even know how, you know, the person that wrote this book knew that I was interested in these topics. And it was just sort of <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a kind of a you know under the table sort of thing <laughs> at first. You know, when it when it first came out, it, the Patriot Act was was flying full steam, um, and uh, you know I had I was concerned about my family if it got uh, you know too popular in the wrong circles. Uh, so I kept it anonymous at first, and and kept it anonymous for some time until I thought you know kind of the coast was a little bit clear and I could actually promote it. What made you think uh, the the coast was clear? Um, seems to me like in the last few years things have gone in the opposite direction. Um, is it just personal position basically that made you think that, or is it something 
that you see in the world around you? <laughs> no, it was definitely my my personal situation. Um, I had you know uh, people in my family that I wasn't too worried about anymore, um, and uh, I was I had some type of clue of how um, you know prosecutions under the Patriot Act were going. Uh, in which direction they were going, uh, and you know my personal circumstances changed in such a way that I was okay. I can do this now. Well, I'm very glad that you did because uh, it's uh, enabled us to ha- to have this uh, this chat. So it's it's been really <laughs> awesome to to get your your perspective on the book. And, oh, uh, thank you. I would I would just wanted to say thank you as well for the book. I uh, really enjoyed it. And I would really love to uh, to get one of the copies for of this article, the last art of living with intent. If they, um, if ah, you could get yes. one of those, it would be awesome. Sure. Me too. Um, set, okay. Send me an email. Uh, the probably the easiest one is uh, admin a d m i n at freemansperspective. Just the way it sounds. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, freemansperspective dot com. I will. Thanks. Sure. I'll be glad to send them out. Well, I also just want to say thanks so much, Paul. It's been really great talking to you. Really fantastic book and, and uh, really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to um, tell us your thoughts about it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, guys. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for uh, coming along, and, uh, and thanks again, Paul. And um, it will become a podcast on the voluntarylife.com, so, uh, yeah, keep an eye out, and you'll see it go up live at some point there, too. Super. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, thanks. Paul. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.